Okay, we have finished down to uh, verse 4 of the first chapter of Luke. Now remember, uh, Luke wrote two books. He addressed them to the same person, a, a middle-level Roman uh, bureaucrat. Now, I'm not using bureaucrat in a bad sense. Uh, I don't know how good he was. But this is based on the, the way that Luke addresses him. As I translated it here, I translated most honorable Theophilus. Uh, and if I did it literally, it would not have any meaning uh, to a modern reader. But so just take my word that the, uh, the way he addresses him, the title he gives Theophilus is uh, one that identifies him as a mid-level. Now that means he was not a part of the emperor's household who were the upper level. And he wasn't a part of the uh, governmental agencies that uh, either supervised uh, provinces, they were called senatorial provinces, which means they were completely peaceful, or they were called imperial provinces, meaning that uh, they had to station the army in them, and those the uh, emperor controlled those provinces, so that he was somewhere in between. He could have been what's called a, a legate, although I can't figure out why he wouldn't have used the term legate, that is Luke, if that's what he were. But that's the level. He could be a, sen a, a representative of the senatorial uh, apparatus. Now don't go out and say that's, you know that's what Theophilus was. Because just to be frank with you, nobody knows what exactly what he was. He was though high enough up in the, the government that he was addressed by a very honorable uh, title of address. Now, after that introduction, dedication to Theophilus, remember the purpose, there's two purposes. Luke said he was going to set all these things down in order. Now, a lot of people, well, I'm just going to ask you, what does it mean to you that he's going to set it down in order? Yo, I want to get somebody else here. Chronological. Chronological. Okay, that's one possibility. Is there any other possibilities that you can think of? Well, he said that many had, had written accounts. Mm -hmm. Maybe he felt he had access to some eyewitnesses, this was more accurate? I'm not sure that accurate is the term, but yes, that's what. Actually, none of the Gospels are in chronological order. So, what other kind of order could it be in? Topical. What? Topical. Topical. That's one order. Uh, the gospel that I think is most in topical order is Matthew. He, he puts together uh, like what we call the Sermon on the Mount. He collects nearly all of the ethical teaching of Jesus and puts them together. If you check him against Luke and Mark, you will find that a lot of those things happened at different times. I think not only at different times, I think he taught that more, some of them more than once. Remember, 
they didn't have television or radio where he could go on the air and teach them for once and know that they went to everybody there. So when he moved about, certainly he would repeat the material that he had used. That's the reason that the gospel writers had a great deal of leeway in the way they organized them because they could, they could take what he said this time or the next time or the other place. Uh, what kind of order do you think Luke is in? It's not chronological. It's not uh, topical. What? By events? Event? Well, I, I'm not Importance. sure. I, uh, what? Importance? Leading up to his fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, uh, leading up to his death. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure exactly know. what that means. Well, he wanted them to see that he was the Messiah. So he. He led them like children into different understandings of who he was until the triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Okay, now after the class had a chance to talk, I'll let you talk, Jesse. Um, Luke writing to a, I've heard they was writing to the Greek mind, to that type of mindset. He wanted to put things in a, in a order that would be, present his story, the story of Jesus, so that they would accept it, just like he was doing for the opposite. Okay. Uh, by the way, we usually say he was writing for the, but it's the most Jewish gospel of all. <laughs> uh, I think the order he's talking about is <clears throat> pretty well what some of you have said. He presented them in a dramatic order leading to uh, the crucifixion and resurrection. <clears throat> now in one sense all the Gospels did that. Luke supplies some information that we don't have in any other gospel. He has a detailed description of the birth of John the Baptist, the relationship between John the Baptist, the kinship relationship between John the Baptist and Jesus. He presents material that almost uh, has to come from Mary. Uh, the one I used last week was she treasured up these things in her heart. And I can't see anybody else knowing that uh, except Mary herself. So uh, I'm going to quote in, or allude to N.T. Wright here. He thinks all the Gospels are showing how God through Jesus became king of the Jews. The central thing is that sign that was on the cross and what did it say? The king of the Jews. Is he trying to convert or uh, Theophilus? That no, Theophilus has already been converted. And he is writing him an orderly. I, I think it would be better to say orderly, perhaps, than in, in, a, in an order. He has a purpose, and that's, it is a purpose. He goes from where he was to where, where he he wants Theophilus to be. And so don't, uh, there's just a lot of people uh, want to 
they're, they're kind of upset when they discover that the Gospels are not in chronological order. Now that's our Western mind at work. We think a biography ought to start at birth and go day by day to de to till the death, and in the case of, of Jesus, his resurrection. But that's not the way. You won't find any history written in that time that is exactly chronological. Suetonius comes closest because he deals with the 12 Caesars in, in basically chronological order, but he is not, uh, he doesn't deal with in each one of them's life. He takes actually when they become emperor. He doesn't write about their birth and early life. Uh, Would another little part of this be that we should not only just look at Luke, but at Luke and Acts together as, a, as an overall purpose and order what he was trying to present? Yes. Uh, people, the women in the women of the word Tuesday morning class. I, mine, Mina was doing her lesson. Uh, this, she tries to get it done uh, by Saturday. Even if she has to work some on Saturday, and it, they went into uh, the early part of Luke. This, this this lesson, so who, that's apparent that you need to see them together as volume one and volume two, and so that's another order if you want to think of it that way. But I'm uh, trying to compare this. I, I'm in the process of writing a biography on my father. And while it's generally chronological, I find areas uh, where it requires uh, going back or going forward to tie together uh, certain uh, concepts about him, I guess. So maybe that is a little bit what Luke does here. Uh, could be, uh, because uh, he doesn't, he's not as topical as Matthew but he is much more topical than Mark. And, but now, you know the most topical of the Gospels? John. John, and, and this is something that surprised me. John is a collection of conversations that Jesus had. And that's that surprised me when I when I discovered that in translation, and he he demonstrates the development of Jesus as the Messiah through conversations he has, through important conversations, uh, and even in something like uh, the healing of the man born blind, which is one. That really is a dramatic uh, dialogue. Uh, and I love the man born blind because he finally got sick and tired of the Pharisees badgering him. And he, they came to him and said, well now, we know that this man can't, can't heal blind people because we know that sinners, God does not hear sinners. And he said, well, the only thing I know is I was blind and now I see. <laughs> Period. End of discussion. Uh, so keep, all in, keep that in mind, uh, that, that order is you're going to have to discover the order he teaches in, uh, Luke, because none of our categories of order, modern categories of order, f quite fit what, John, uh, what Luke does. Okay, now, this is the birth of John the Baptist. Now, why, 
would, would Luke start there? Because John starts Jesus' official, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay, okay. But remember, Mark and Matthew say start the, only they don't tell anything much about John but they just say that John was the beginning the voice in the wilderness. what the voice in the wilderness you're the voice in the wilderness <laughs> yes and uh, but Luke investigated and found details about that now, that may be what he means by orderly, that he, he took the basic outline of Mark and filled it out so that it is more detailed. And if so, perhaps Theophilus was a man who needed details. We have to, have to bear that in mind that that's a possibility, that he is appealing to the, the method of learning that Theophilus had. Because the way we learn is very individualistic. There was something last night that just as we were, mine and I were having our time together in our bedroom, with the door closed, just, just, it's just time to, to talk and visit and all. And my, there was something uh, we were watching on television, and uh, it, it's one of these uh, shows about the SWAT teams. Uh, one is Detroit and the other is uh, Kansas City, Missouri. And I said, Mina, we've seen that one. And she said, well, I'm not sure we have. She said, I'll have to see what happened. And that was exactly what she sees things to learn them. I hear things to learn them. I learn much more by hearing. I never did like audiovisual material when I was in school. I got bored, completely bored. But let a teacher tell me something and it would be mine forever. So I'm using that to illustrate the fact that Theophilus' way of learning may be what's at work here. Now, I'm not sure of that, but it would account for where John started in detail. It, you know, Theophilus could have been a detailed man. In fact, a lot of bureaucrats are detailed people. They, and uh, so I'm highly speculative there. So just keep that in mind as a possibility. Don't put all your weight down on it, okay? In the days of Herod the king of Judea, now, Luke anchors his treatment of the gospel story in very firmly by in history. He is the one who is more interested in the actual history. Now, you can deduce from the, the other gospels that it was in the days of Herod except John. You can't, you can't find uh, John mentioning anything like that because John was interested in Jesus' personal interactions with important people in his life. And so he wasn't interested in the overall history uh, of the ancient world. Luke was, and that would be of interest to an official in the Roman government. So he says, in the days of Herod the king of Judea, there was a priest of Abijah's division. Now, what on earth does 
Abijah's division mean? Yeah, I believe it. And when David was king, he established these uh, divisions for the priests that would uh, schedule their services in the temple. I believe there were 20 of those, and they did it twice a year. Yes. If I'm not mistaken. See, it didn't take long for the natural increase in the numbers of people that they had more priests than they could use. The Catholic Church certainly wishes they, that that was true today. They don't have enough priests because most, most young men, even devout Catholics, don't want to, the rigors of being uh, celibate in a modern world and so they don't have, but the opposite problem was there when, in David. So he divided them into 20 courses. They, sometimes they're translated courses. <coughs> I, think, I thought division would be a, a term that would be more meaningful to the day. And so twice a year they got to serve in the temple. The rest of the year they stayed home. And I believe they served a month at a, 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 a time. And that would mean two months you served and 10 months you, well actually, ten, uh, either 10 or 12 months according to. Uh, they were lunar, lunar. Yeah, they were lunar months. And uh, so that's what it means. He, he belonged to the one that originally was headed by Abiathar. And if you go back to the Old Testament, you can find uh, mention of that Ab Abiathar's division of priesthood. Uh, named Zechariah, his wife was a descendant of Aaron. So what about that piece of information? Huh? The priests were married back then. Yeah. Yes. Which is okay. Like today in the Catholic Church. Yeah. And he was on both sides. John was the, the descendant of priesthood on both sides of his ancestry. And by the way, that's still a matter of Jewish pride. Uh, People that are named Cohen or Kohen uh, are claiming descendant from a, a, from a priest, and most of them are probably true uh, that they are. So, but this is this is something. It's just like the John um, Luke is going to show the same thing about uh, Mary and Joseph. They both were descendants of David. And that made him doubly fulfillment of the promise God made to David that I will raise up a king from your, those who descend from you. Bringing out these details like this, it makes me seem like Luke was preparing like an a, a, a almost legal testimony about who Christ was. And that, again, is part of the idea I think of order. He wanted to present it, in a sense, evidence or testimony that would show who, show Jesus who he really was. Okay. Actually, testimony that would show at least Theophilus the reality of the faith he had accepted. Mm -hmm. And that, again, as I say, you have to see what order Luke does. And that's what we're doing. Okay. His wife was a descendant of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous in the sight of God. They were living without blame according to the commandments and requirements of God. Now, this is a literary convention. Remember, it says about Job that he was living without blame or blameless is usually translated. Now, that is a way 
of describing that they were faithful to the covenant. It doesn't mean they were sinless. Only one human being has ever been sinless. And so when it says they were living without blame, according to the commandments of the law, it means they were faithful to the covenant. They did what God wanted them to do. They kept the festivals. They believed in one God. They, they observed the dietary laws. They ate kosher. Uh, and these were all marks that they were members of the covenant. Now, it's a very important thing because the teaching of the New Testament is that now we believers, all of us, Jew and Gentile alike, have been admitted to covenant relationship with God. And it, see, again, it doesn't mean we live sinlessly. It means that we do, as we really give a commitment to doing what God wants us to do. Like the young man that was introduced in the service this morning. He, see, he really takes covenant responsibilities seriously. One of our modern problems is we think that our, we have two lives, a secular life and a religious life. The Bible has nothing to do with that idea. That is an enlightenment philosophy. And we, so many people, even believers, have swallowed that hook, line, and sinker. We are either covenant people or we're not covenant people. And that if we are covenant people, we govern every aspect of our lives by covenant responsibilities. And that's, I think, uh, Randy has done as good a job of bringing that out as anybody I've ever seen. He has not mentioned that at all, but the, the way in which he has approached this is we need to apply covenant responsibilities when we work. And most of us are work and are glad to have a job, and so it's, if we don't do it then, a good portion of our lives it is out from under the control of our relationship to God. And that should not be. Um, I talked to him after the service, and he said, you know, the thing about it is that you're in the Word and you're doing what God wants you to do. It's really quite easy. I didn't hear that last. It's really quite easy. Yeah, it's, well. It's not a burden at all. It's because you're living that automatically. Well, one thing I was really happy he did uh, was when he turned the pyramid upside down. Do you remember how often I've done that? <laughs> because uh, if, you leave, if he left it the other way, and I'm not criticizing him for doing that because it made the point that Jesus was our boss, the leader, and we, we are submissive to him. But he then talked about the quality of leadership, and then he turned it upside down. You, we lead by serving. And that, I, I thought to myself, yeah. Charles, you just used that term, and you know, my pragmatic personality, I have wanted him to say, use that term, secular and sacred, because I've known personally some people who have said, leaders in the church that that's my secular life has nothing to do with my sacred yeah you know and so it's not he's gotten the point over well yes uh, see and i think that's a great way to do it i never in the 10 years that i preached at oak hills i never preached a sermon on racial equality 
vis-a-vis -vis black people or vis-a-vis -vis Hispanics. But every time I taught in a class or every time I was preaching a sermon where that idea was important to understanding, I just mentioned it. And it got through. It got through. My, the, I'm going to talk about, if I were going to uh, brag, I'm using it in the sense that the Apostle Paul did, it would be the fact that if you watch people come out of the worship center at Oak Hills, it is almost identical in racial makeup as the city of San Antonio, which you can't imagine how satisfying that is to me. That was one of my major goals when I preached here. And you don't have to preach on it. In fact, maybe the, that it works better if you don't, if you just teach uh, the principles that lead that. Because, you know, Jesus didn't ever tell us that all people are equal in God's sight. There's not a, not a statement of that. There's come some that come fairly close, but they don't say it. But the outcome is that people like the Apostle Paul, depending on the teaching of Jesus, do say that. And they learned it from the Lord Jesus. And we are never very wrong if, what, if we learn from Jesus. We may not be completely right because we don't understand it or we don't, we, our, our temperaments get in the way or our temptations overcome us, but you're never far from right if you get your teaching from Jesus. Okay, uh, in spite of this, now I'm, uh, I wanted to, that's even a more, um, it's slightly stronger than the, the words in Greek, but it, it, it's definitely there. It means uh, although, would be, I, I toyed with the idea of saying although, but I thought in spite of this is more modern American English uh, because it's, that's a powerful way of saying it. In spite of the fact they were part of the covenant, they were inheritors of the covenant promises, they were faithful to the covenant, and most Jews would have w said about them, there must be something hidden in their lives. Now that's the way they thought about it. Even today, and uh, I know that not all people who are really having a hard time having children fall into this category, but a lot of them feel somehow or other it's something they have done wrong that keeps them from conceiving a child. I'm here to tell you that's not biblical teaching. That's a, that's a physical fact that you're dealing with. Now, I'm not denying you any opportunity to do and to, to conceive, but I want you to realize there is not a moral blot on your life because you cannot have children. Uh, there's a moral blot on the life of people who could and don't, and I think I can show, because in biblical religion, children are seen as a blessing from God, and to reject the blessing of God for your own personal uh, comfort or desire is, you're in pretty dangerous ground. I've really appreciated how much Randy, and I'm sure the, the leadership, whenever it comes to things like Mother's Day, mm -hmm. or in my 
my case, we had uh, one year where we had a stillborn child. Mm -hmm. And you get this sense of a stigma about it. And I'm so glad that the way that he handles it to where you do not feel yeah. either obligated or that you know you have to participate or, you know, there's nothing wrong about what happened. Yeah. Uh, Lindia, I saw your hand go up. Well, I was thinking, I wish I knew the reference, but in Leviticus, maybe Deuteronomy, where the Jewish people are getting ready to cross over into Canaan, and, and Moses is telling them all the blessings that they're going to have, one statement that he makes is that, you know, your women, your wives will not be childless. Mm -hmm. In other words, but, and I, I was just thinking if you wanted to um, expand on expound on that some what it meant if it was just a promise of growth within the population or if it was a, a deeper promise that the women would always or, okay. And maybe this stems out of that. Oh, uh, yes. Yes. The, I think you're right. And uh, that's the root of it. And remember those promises, and I don't know exactly how to say it, but they're general. general. They are not individualistic. Just like I will heal all your diseases. Now, that one about healing your diseases will eventually come true. But Jesus says we, we won't uh, need to have uh, sexual divisions between us when we are resurrected. Uh, I'm paraphrasing there. And so uh, not all of the promises of God will be fulfilled in the new heaven and the new earth because some of them will no longer be necessary. Okay, but that, uh, Lindy, I'm sure that it's statements like that. See, we have a state, people have a statement today about uh, Jesus healed and did this and that and the other and why doesn't he heal me? And we feel somehow kind of second-class citizens. And I'm trying to tell you that's not the way it works. Just because God doesn't do something you want Him to do for you does not mean He doesn't love you and that you're not in good standing with Him. Yeah. Okay, let's go on. Because Elizabeth was unable to conceive. That's uh, exactly the point. Uh, and both of them were well along in years. Uh, that's just a kind of uh, nice way of saying they were past uh, childbearing. Uh, when Zechariah was serving as a priest before God with his division, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. Now, they divided the things that priests did. Now, the thing that all priests wanted to be selected for was to make the daily sacrifice but only one out of the group. Now, next to that was making the daily incense offering at the three times a day when the people prayed. Uh, morning, noon, and night is the best way to, to, uh, to say it. And I don't know which time this was. It just means that he was selected to do that and it was a great honor to be selected. And so, now notice, we'll learn later that there were a lot of people in the temple compound area, complex, who were there to pray. 
because everyone who could would take that time off and go. But notice uh, he was in this temple, in the sanctuary. This is the holy place, not the most holy, but the holy place uh, where the uh, altar of incense was. And they were waiting for him to come out. And so this is the way it happened. Here was a man being honored, but he was going to be honored beyond his wildest imagination because he also thought that it was too late for them to have children. How many times in the Bible does it have where a woman who was past childbearing had a child? What? Samson's parents. Samson's parents. Samson? Sarah. 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 And possibly Samuel's mother. Now, that's we don't know that for sure because it does not specifically say it. But the implication is uh, she was bordering on being too old, if not already. And this is, it's, it's not predictive in the, in the sense, but it shows that the same God is at work. If God wants you to bear a child, guess what? You will bear a child. Uh, that's, that's just uh, a given. And it's the consistency of God that's at work. And God many times wants to demonstrate to us hard-headed, uh, difficult to teach people that what I want, I will do. That's a, that's a very simple principle, but it is one that escapes so many of us. What I want, I will do. He goes ahead to say, uh, at the hour of burning incense, the whole assembly of the people was outside praying. Now that doesn't mean that every Jew in Jerusalem was there, but it means that the, the available number of people were there. There was a whole crowd of people. This was something that uh, was not done under a basket or behind the door. This was something that is that Jerusalem is going to know about. Now, not all the details, but we'll see what they knew about. He says, uh, an angel of the Lord appeared to Ze Zechariah. He was standing on the right hand side of the altar. You know what? That needs to have a col semicolon. And the capital H needs to be a lowercase. See? I, I'm proofreading this as I... <laughs> I've already done it, but... Yeah. Uh, when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and overcome with fear. Now, notice, it's one of the ironies of the Bible, is that, a, that people who should have expected God to intervene are always surprised and sometimes terrified by God's intervention. Uh, I always think about a, a, a thing that happened while I was preaching here. Uh, that was the time, you remember, when the uh, saffron-clad people were pretty well, uh, all right, they were uh, what I would call quasi-Buddhist because they, they didn't submit to the full regimen, but they were around. And there was a, 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 fa a family here. He was uh, a resident in 
otolaryngology at the medical school and they had a child about five or six years old and they were coming out of a, a main one of the main post offices and there was one of these people standing there in his long row and just as casual as it could be this six-year-old boy said look mommy there's Jesus now we that's what we ought to be like we oughtn't to be surprised if Jesus shows up but you know what I don't measure up to that and I doubt that few of us in this class do I expect him and yet if he appears in my lifetime I will be surprised I oughtn't to be and I know that but I'm just telling you I will be it's just like when uh, Peter was under a death sentence in, in prison everybody praying for him he shows up at the door and they say what do you mean he's at the door <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> that's thank you Jesse that is exactly the, the point okay he was startled and overcome by fear but the angel said to him now I have indented this to show that it is either poetry or nearly poetry and I've done this throughout my translation one of the places that I'm proudest of that is in the prologue the first 14 uh, verses of the first chapter of the Gospel of John because it almost scans as uh, Greek poetry uh, but Greek poetry was based mainly on a, a six-footed uh, line uh, and uh, we don't have uh, the, most of our poetry is made is based on a five uh, accented line stop being afraid Zachariah now one of the things you, that Greek does is you can tell whether it is they're told, they're told in the command to uh, start doing something, to stop doing or stop doing something, or whether they're to start doing it, and it depends on the tense of the verb. And this is stop doing it. And so I've tried to make that uh, apparent in the translation. Stop being afraid, Zechariah, because your prayer has been heard. Now, where on earth do you find Zechariah pray for a child? But I think we can safely assume he had in the past. Although it could mean nothing more than the prayer you've made today, which would be uh, maybe not specifically to have a son, but for the people of Israel to prosper, uh, something like that. Okay, your wife will bear a son, and you will name him John. His birth will be a joy and delight for you and many people will rejoice at his birth. Can you kind of hear a poetic uh, tone to that? I'm no poet, so I'm, I can't make, a, tra make any claim to translate it into poetry, but I tried to get a little formality to it and structure so it would be that way. In the Greek, is the your prayer, is it specifically his, or could it be the prayers that have been set up for you? Uh, your wife's prayer, your family's prayer, or is it specifically this in the Greek? My guess, and it's only a guess, is that it refers to the prayers he was making at the time. Uh, he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will never drink wine or beer. Now, uh, until I really did this, I didn't know that uh, the, pe the people in Israel knew how to brew beer, but they did. Uh, and it's very seldom mentioned. 
there, uh, but there's a few uh, places in the Old Testament. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the tombs in Egypt uh, from about 4000 BC, uh, they found a jug with evaporated beer in it. And they could know, they put water in it and you could still smell the malt uh, in it. So it, it, that's probably the first alcoholic drink that our ancestors ever made was beer. But this is a description of a person under the uh, Nazarite vow. Uh, they didn't drink any kind of alcoholic beverage. They didn't cut their hair. They lived simply. And so I could have summed this up, but it wouldn't have been meaningful to a modern reader. He will be a Nazarite from his birth. Not a Nazarene, but a Nazarite. Uh, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb. Each one of these things is a, a statement about him. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will be, go before him. Now, him. Who is him? Jesus. What? Jesus. Yes. And I didn't know, and I still don't know how, to bring that out. Because if I put down the Messiah, uh, I'm presuming upon the text. And I try not to do that. But that's what he's doing. This, anybody who was knowledgeable of the scriptures would have known who the him was. Uh, because uh, sometimes he was just called the coming one uh, as John alluded to him sometime. Could you use the capital H instead? Uh, I don't capitalize any of the pronouns so because they didn't do that then. Uh, okay. He will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. Now you know, do you know enough about the Passover Seder, Cedar Seder uh, to know that they set aside a cup of wine and it's Elijah's cup. Now I had a, a friend who that I was in rice with and in fact he was in the Sakowitz family who owned the big uh, department store in Houston, the Sakowitzes, and they were a very wealthy people. And just one second, and uh, we were invited to their uh, Passover. They had a mezzanine in their big dining room, and so us guy could go up in the uh, uh, in the uh, yes, and not government and. He got in serious trouble when he was about 10 or 11 years old. While everybody had their head bowed, he drank the Elijah cup. <laughs> oh, oh my goodness. Oh. And, That's a major. Yes, it was. Uh, he said he ruined it for several weeks. <laughs> okay, our time is up.